you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce John Lecter. John is uh, one of these uh, researchers who has made lots of important uh, contributions to machine learning and is very well known for them. And uh, it's an honor for us to welcome him uh, today uh, here. He currently is at Microsoft Research, but he has an interesting trajectory of uh, um, places where he's worked, uh, mostly in, in industrial life like Microsoft and Yahoo, but at the same time contributing to rather fundamental uh, questions in machine learning uh, in all kinds of areas, and I, I mentioned a few here. Um, I first learned about his work uh, when he worked on ISOMAP, which is a manifold learning method that's been very successful and highly cited, but he's, he's worked on a bunch of um, other um, areas of machine learning, including reinforcement learning, uh, bounds, uh, scaling machine learning, which is, I guess, what he's going to tell us about today, um, hashing representations, reductions, and so um, I'm, I'm really excited to hear what he's going to tell us about in his talk. So, John, here you go. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I've been working at uh, I worked at Yahoo Research for about six years, and then Microsoft for about a year. And uh, one of one of the things that comes up there quite a bit is, is you have quite a bit more data than you would typically have uh, when you're working with just a uh, little data sets, people labeled uh, on their own. So I'm going to tell you about some of the highlights of how you try to learn from lots of data. So w when you start looking at this you see potentially two things. Um, one thing is that you have a lot of data, okay, so that's sort of obvious, and that means you need your computers to run well and so forth. But the other thing is that the data is odd. So typically, when you have large data sets, like uh, when you're collecting a whole bunch of click data from ads, the nature of this data is not the same as, as what you would get if you asked somebody to label things. And that means you need to take into account exactly how you're getting the data in the process of learning. And that, that's, that's a lot, quite a bit of fun. Okay, so these two things together are really required in order to succeed when you have a lot of data. You need to understand how the different data sources affect your, um, the, the quality of data that you have. And then, of course, you need to be able to actually do the learning. The first thing I want to talk about is, is a large scale data. So when I was graduating from Caltech, in 97, uh, I was interviewing for a fellowship uh, for my PhD study. And uh, the, the interviewer said, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd like to solve AI. And uh, he said, how? And I said, well, <laughs> I'm going to do parallel learning algorithms, right? Um, and, and he said, no. <laughs> it was more bracing than that. <laughs> this, is, this is really good. I did not get the fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the only thing parallel machines are good for is computational wind tunnels. Uh, so that's, that was disappointing. What's even more disappointing is that he was right at the time. Getting parallel learning to work well uh, is, is not that easy. Uh, at, at the time, there were uh, no parallel learning algorithms which kind of were provably superior to what you could get on a single machine. So that has changed. So this is a particular data set that I was playing with at Yahoo. There are 2.1 tera features. So a, tera, a feature here is a non-zero entry in your data matrix. Right? So this is maybe 20 terabytes or so um, in terms of the actual size of the data set. Uh, so this is a sparse data set. Uh, you have a bunch of features which involve the interaction of, this is an ad data set, so it's the interaction of the ad with the query. Um, and then you want to learn a good linear predictor, which just predicts the probability of click. Right? So there are, you, you can measure the size in several different ways. You can say, look, there's 17 billion examples, or you could say there's 16 million parameters. Some magic going on here, uh, but I won't really discuss that very much. Essentially, you use hashing to, to fix the number of parameters. That turned out to work very well. 
And then we have, of course, these big clusters. So we have uh, clusters with uh, thousands of machines of which you can easily get a thousand machines to learn on at one time. Okay. So when you're trying to learn a good linear predictor, the uh, question is how long does it take? Anybody want to guess? Two hours. Two hours. That, that's how long a, a grad student is willing to wait for an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's sample. When I started on this project, the ideas that people were using were about a factor of 10 smaller. And the amount of time people were willing to wait was about a factor of 10 larger. But when I finished, it was 70 minutes. Uh, so the interesting thing about this is that it's actually an answer to this guy. <laughs> because you can say, look, there's 2.1 Tera features, and it takes 70 minutes, and then divide this by that, and it's 500 megafeatures per second. So 500 megafeatures per second, the, the, the Ethernet interfaces on the machines are 1 gigabit per second. So the number of bits per feature is certainly larger than two. And that means that we're succeeding in a, in a real sense. There's, uh, this is faster than the IO bandwidth of any single machine in the computation. Um, so that means it's faster than all possible uh, single machine learning outcomes. So it's no, no longer the case that it's just computational windows. So it's not, uh, Plausibly, a feature is uh, four bytes or something like that if you press it well. So it's, it's only clearing that hurdle by a factor of 10 or so. Um, but but this, is, this is the first time when I've actually seen this, where you can actually take the, time, the running time and divide it by the data set size and say, look, there's just no single machine that will ever be invented in the future. You can do the same thing. Anyway, that made me feel pretty good because uh, you know, it's just the kind of things you remember for a while. <laughs> okay, so I want to first tell you about how this works. And the essential idea is to use uh, all reduce. So who, who knows MPI here? Okay, so, yeah. so MPI is a message passing interface. It's a, uh, it's a library of communication primitives. Um, or parallel computation. Now, the thing which is tricky about MPI is that, um, okay, so the thing that's tricky here is that this data is not uh, typically stored in an MPI style cluster. It's typically stored on a Hadoop cluster or some other big MapReduce cluster. So, um, starting about a decade ago, uh, people started creating these clusters which have uh, combined data and compute. So you have lots of disks spread all over the cluster, and then you have MapReduce jobs you can execute on them. So who understands MapReduce? Most people. Okay, so uh, for those who don't, uh, when you try to do MapReduce, what happens is you divide your computation up into maps, which run on pieces of the data. They each emit a little bit of information, and then you combine those with a reduce. Uh, and perhaps you do this multiple times in order to finish your computation. The nice thing about MapReduce is that it can be made robust. Um, and you, you can just run it on these large clusters and it works. <coughs> okay, so um, the not, not nice thing about MapReduce is that it doesn't play well with MPI itself. So if you try to, MPI likes to run its cluster and MapReduce likes to run its cluster and, uh, and these two don't, don't play well. Nevertheless, there's something very cool in MPI, which is it's already primitive. So I'm just going to describe how that works. So uh, this is the initial state. You have a number at every node. And this is the final state. You have some goal numbers at every node. Okay. And now the question is, how do you get from the initial state to the final state? So one way to do this <coughs> is you wire things up into a binary tree. And then you, uh, you add 
add things up as you go up the tree. So you have 1 plus 2 plus 5 is 8, and 3 plus 4 plus 6 is 13. And then uh, you have 8 plus 7 plus 13 is 28. And then you broadcast this back down the tree. So this is a combination of, of reduce and broadcast. And so now there's a certain properties of this which are extremely important. Uh, naively, you might imagine that going from the initial state to the final state required quite a bit of uh, communication. But in fact, the bandwidth required is just at most a factor of six more than the number of bits that you're reducing on. Because for an internal node, you have a number coming in, a number coming in, a number going out, a number coming back, and two other numbers going out. That's a factor of six. So uh, that, that's very nice. Um, <coughs> another property which is important is that you can pipeline this. So often you want to do all reduce on more than one number, on, on a vector of numbers. And when you do it on a vector of numbers, This operation can be happening, well, this operation can be happening for some of the numbers. So adding up both things at the root can be happening while uh, this operation is happening for uh, some of the numbers further down in the vector. So you can pipeline the process. So you, so you can keep, essentially you can be using all of your network links at the same time uh, at near full speed uh, so that you there's basically no latency concerns. So in, in a network, typically you have to worry about the bandwidth and the latency. And the latency is a non-issue when you have a vector of numbers to do all reduce on. So that's a false property. The, the third one, I think, is the most important one. Uh, you don't have to rewrite your code. So um, let me show you this. All the code that I'm talking about is open source. Um, uh, so the all reduce function is in accumulate. And that is all of the impact on the code. This is this is this is code which is optimized. This is VW, this is an open source um, project of mine. Uh, and this is the only place where you actually call all reduce in the main code. Okay, so this is very different. If you if you have any experience using MapReduce, uh, at least on Hadoop, it's very awkward because you have to refactor your program into MapReduce operations, which involves you know cutting and pasting and all of stuff around and and since you, it, changing your algorithm to work with your communication uh, primitive. But here. You just, uh, <coughs> when it's time to sync things up, you just call the all reduce and it runs. So that's, that's fantastic as far as getting things done. Right? <coughs> okay, so um, we coded this up. We tried it first to make things work. The MPI didn't work. Um, <coughs> then we, we made our own. It turned out to be very easy. It only took like a week. Um, and, and then, uh, and then we optimized it to work in a Hadoop environment. Okay, so in Hadoop, there's certain things that are not nice, uh, and there are, there are other things that are very nice about Hadoop. So one thing that Hadoop does, Hadoop is a MapReduce infrastructure, is it moves your program to your data. So when your program is much smaller than your data, this is, this is a very nice operation. It does this in a way where you don't have to worry about exactly where the data is. <coughs> So in order to launch VW uh, to run this kind of uh, computation, you have essentially a map job, which moves VW, the code, to the data. OK, so then another thing that happens is Hadoop MapReduce is robust to failures. All reduce generally is not robust to failures. So once you create this communication infrastructure, 
if a node dies, then the computation dies and you have to start over. That's not so good. Now, in a real cluster, you know, the, the failures typically happen at the beginning. The most common failure mode is a disk failure. So what that means is that if you can delay the initialization of your communication infrastructure until after you've passed the data once, uh, you can restart on a disk failure in the initial pass without failing the entire computation. So that, that's, that's, that's extremely helpful. Um, that, that, that gets rid of at least the first order of magnitude failures. Um, so that, that, that's it for cool. Um, the last trick is speculative execution. So in MapReduce on Hadoop, if uh, you have a bunch of different map jobs, each of which is running on a piece of the data, and uh, you know sometimes these are very slow because maybe that map job has a bunch of other people other, other jobs on the same computer, which are each using the disk, and the disk is getting worn out and thrashing up between the jobs badly. So what Hadoop can do is it can uh, say, uh, I'm going to run the same map job on the same data on a different machine, because it stores data and interprets it. So that's, that's nice. Uh, we can take advantage of the same effect. This is, this is quite important. If, uh, <coughs> if we didn't take advantage of this, it would have been 50 megabytes per second, rather than 500. Because if you have a thousand nodes, <laughs> one of your nodes is going to be slow, it's quite hot. So uh, this deals with sort of the slow node problem, uh, which is pretty significant. Okay, so what this meant in practice for us on real clusters was if we could run VW up to about 10,000 node hours. Now the computation that I told you was about 1,000 node hours. And that was the largest that we found a practical need to actually run. More typical would be 50 or 100 node hours. So are there questions about this? So this is the mechanics of how you actually get the algorithm running. Uh, efficiently. Um, so afterwards you are saying you are using MPI though on those uh, on those nodes, the actual uh, communication, or is that kind of mapped onto the Hadoop's reduction step? So we're using direct network communication. I got MPI similar thing. Got PMP. Yeah, and, and that's that's critical. Uh, I think so. We spent things at about a factor of a hundred or what people were actually using. About a factor of 10 there was uh, just using network communication rather than using disk-based communication. Why? Because there's no centralized place where everything has to be crammed down into. It's, it's not an issue of centralization because uh, Hadoop itself is decentralized uh, as far as where the data goes. Uh, it, the, the problem is that if you're writing to disk and you're reading off disk, it's just phenomenally slower than network communication. So that, that's about an order of magnitude of two of them back to. The other order of magnitude just has to do with better algorithms. <coughs> yeah? How do you handle the all reduce with the uh, speculative uh, execution? You need to duplicate the communication? Yeah, so, so the trick is that the, the, if you have delayed initialization and you do it with the right communication protocol, then if a node is slow, it won't begin initialization and, and so uh, you, know, you have your slow node running for a while, and the group says, okay, I'm going to restart. So the, 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 you restart on the node, it's almost certainly faster, and then that one will be the one which initializes. And then this one will try to initialize at the end, but, uh, but the initialization will say, no, die, and it will just die out. Okay, so. Um, one of the tricks, one of the algorithmic tricks, which was very helpful, was this idea of, of hybrid online and batch learning. So within machine learning, just kind of, uh, just for, just purely for optimization purposes, there's, there's kind of two, uh, two approaches. One approach is sort of online learning, where you see an example and do an update. And another approach is batch learning, 
where you go through all of your examples and then you do an update. So in a parallel setting, you can of course do the parallel versions of this. So uh, you can run LBFGS, which is low memory BFGS. BFGS is the first letter of the four names of different authors, all of whom in 1970 proposed the same algorithm. <coughs> So th this is this is a nice algorithm. Which, um, so the, the property of this algorithm is that it, it approximates the inverse Hessian directly. And if you if you think about the Taylor approximation, if you're trying to get to the minimum of some function, you have the gradient, which is your first order, and then you have your inverse Hessian, which is, gives you the second order approximation. Right? So in general, you can't use the inverse Hessian because just representing it would kill you. We're working on 16 million parameters, so 16 million squared would, would not work. Uh, LBFGS approximates the inverse session in a low rank way directly. And that makes it, that means you don't have to worry about inversion, uh, and you don't have to worry about running out of memory, and so it, it's very helpful. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so LBFGS, uh, like all batch algorithms, is very slow initially. So for the first 10 passes of the data, it does nothing useful. And then you can run this in parallel using all reduce on the gradients. Uh, and it gets better and better and better, and eventually it becomes pretty good. Did you have a question? Yeah, when you're saying <coughs> online here, are you literally meaning sequential like each example? Or are you doing, are you doing back, like mini batches? So what's happening here with online learning is uh, on each individual node, we're running through the data. and uh, and just doing local updates. And then at the end of the pass, we're averaging the data together. So I mean online learning with parameter average. Okay, so uh, online learning in the first pass is something pretty useful. And then you average things, it keeps getting better and better and better and better and better and better and better. And, better. and it keeps getting better, but you know, it's not converting very quickly to the best. This is it's kind of a weakness of online learning. Online learning can take a long time to converge, particularly when you have, so this is the splice that recognition data set. It's one of these data sets where you have a lot of covariant features. If you have covariant features, it becomes relatively important to have a second order method uh, to, to optimize well. <coughs> All right, so um, an obvious trick <coughs> is you initialize with online learning and then you switch to LBFGS. This obvious trick is super useful because you're done after about 20 passes. So that, that's good. It's great. So uh, it works. It works better than okay. So you can imagine just using LBFGS after 10 passes of LBFGS, and even at pass 30. So it's 20 more passes past 10. It's not nearly as good as. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, what's the objective? This is an no, area under the precision recall curve. So this, every data set has its own particular objective. This is the one people typically use for this data set. OK, so is 0.6 or 0.55 good for this data set? Or do we have uh, yeah, so we were 0 0.01 better than any published result. Um, not, not really significant, but essentially we're doing the same as it's been done previously, but much faster. So I guess one question is, why does this work so well? Like we're, we're doing much better than, so one pass of online, and 19 passes of LBFGS, he's doing much better than 30 passes of LBFGS. And that, that's, that's uh, so my, my best explanation for that is that uh, when you're doing online learning, you're doing very rapid updates. And that means that in terms of the dual, you can kind of make uh, rapid progress. So uh, when I say the dual, what I mean is you can think of the weight vector as a combination of the weight vectors of all the individual examples. 
So you can kind of, <coughs> this, this is intuition, but you can get uh, the dimensionality of the weight vector in terms of the dual can be much higher when you're doing online learning than when you're doing fast learning. Uh, when you're doing second order fast learning, however, you can make big steps and that can be very powerful. So the combination of the two seems to work together very well. Anyway, if you're doing uh, serious optimization, um, it's, it's not always the case that online takes a long time to converge. There's many data sets where online seems to just give you to the solution that you want. Um, but uh, the combination of online followed by LVMGS, I've not seen fail. Yeah? Well, how about the interpretation of this initially, your, your parameters are so bad, they're random, yeah. that any progress you make is going to help you, and if you can do that progress quickly, why not? Sure, I mean, that's, 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 that's obviously, that's a reason to do online, but it's not a reason for LBFGS at 30 passes. See, LBFGS at 30 passes is the same At that point, it's a one step here. from a bad initialization, right? So if you just do your first, you know, 20 iterations online, and then switch over to BFGS to sort of finish it off, yeah. it seems like that simple recipe has an intuitive interpretation, I think. Get somewhere reasonable yeah. quickly, yeah. and then yeah. second order it. So, so is it definitely what we're thinking about. Yeah. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that if you, if you look at here, and you go over that far, so like that, uh, you see that you know, purple is doing very well. So switching over at one is quite good. If you start here, and you go this far, then LBFGS still is not doing as good. Right? And that's, that's kind of strange. Because the initialization points are essentially the same to performance. Is this um, training performance or out of sample performance? It's out of sample. So could it be that um, stochastic gradient online is finding <coughs> sort of a, well, I guess this is a convex problem, right? Uh, <laughs> is it? No. It's not? The, the metric here is not convex anyways. Yeah. Just area into the but what is optimizing metric. is convex? Y yes, that's true. So in, in the non-convex setting, online is, online is believed to have the advantage that it, it can find, well, escape poor local minima, but it could also escape poor regions even in the convex setting yes. faster. Yeah. Yeah. That might explain why LBFGS is kind of stuck for a long time before it escapes, whereas online can escape very quickly. So I think uh, just the fact that LBFGS takes 11 passes is useful, just has to do with, uh, you know, Best algorithms just, there's a minimum number of steps to do anything useful here. And batch algorithms just take a long time to take a minimum number of steps. Okay, so uh, we also compared some other algorithms. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, we're doing better. Uh, so this is Marty Zinkovich's approach. So here, what happens is you do online learning on every node. Okay, so what you do is you create an overcomplete partition so that every example is on one quarter of the nodes. So it involves a lot of shuffling of data. And then you run online learning on each of the individual nodes and then you average things at the end. So that's, that's the blue. And then uh, this is this is mini batch here. So this is a your question. So the idea here is that you're doing, you run through a bunch of examples on each individual node and then you average results. Uh, you average the gradient and then you do an update. And then you just keep on doing that over and over and over again. So this graph understates the value of this algorithm because this is just talking about the, comp the prediction performance. In terms of computation performance, this point is much faster than this point, which is much, much faster than this point. This was 40,000 node hours. Um, 40,000 was difficult to do. It's an experiment that's not so easy to repeat. Um, because if things fail, you have to restart. Okay, so um, 
why does this work better? Well, we're working better than this approach because we're communicating during computation more. So we have more parent optimization going on. Also, I think the combination of the online plus the batch gives us a substantial lift if you think back to here, where I was talking about. So you can see that just online alone, he's really cutting the mustard. And then why is it better than here? Uh, so there's a lot of communication going on here. So there's a lot of synchronization. But mini batch alone, especially with the mini batch sizes that were required in order to make to amortize the communication, um, you end up having a very large mini batch size, which means that you fall into the same kind of problem as LBFGS taking a long time to initialize. But it's worse than that because the mini batch approach um, wasn't second order, it was only first order. Okay. So that's, that's handling the computation. And now I want to talk about how the data itself is kind of off. Are there questions about the computation? The optimization? So how do you look at non-complex optimization? Yes. So the same kind of, a, so when you're doing non-convex things, you can't do parameter averaging right. because it, it just takes you into crazy space. Did you try? Um, I went and visited Yon Lacoon's lab and I talked to uh, Clement. Uh -huh. And he implemented, he, he, he took the all reduced library that we created and he put it in the torch. And we tried it on some you know, networks. And indeed, he went into crazy space. As you expect to uh, LBFGS is still a valid document. <coughs> But uh, LBFGS without initialization feels pretty, uh, I don't know, uh, limited. Uh, so we have a paper that we submitted to NIPS just now talking about using active learning techniques in order to speed up parallel learning for non convex implementations. <coughs> so another project which I haven't, I'm not going to really talk about in great detail, is we've been figuring out how to do active learning. <coughs> So, uh, and one of the difficulties with active learning is that uh, most of the criteria which exist don't work if you have any noise. So can't you just do mini batch SGD, asynchronous SGD, or something like that, like after the first epoch and then LBFGS? Yeah, so mini batch, so asynchronous is a very dangerous word in my experience. Uh, we, we've experimented with various asynchronous parallel algorithms and always been dissatisfied. Uh, so, this is not my first attempt at trail learning. Uh, this is probably my third attempt. Uh, <clears throat> and asynchronous has a severe problem in practice that you just can't debug it. Uh, I mean, you run it two different runs, you get different results. And you know, if you change something, you get a different result. Was it because you were unlucky or lucky or it is just not clear? So I try to stay away from asynchronous algorithms to the extent possible. Now, there's limits to that. If you obviously, if you're, uh, if you have very widely distributed computers, then you have to go asynchronous. But even in that case, I think what you want to do is you want to have an asynchronous algorithm that you can debug, and then you want to deploy it in asynchronous fashion. I have debates about this. Okay, so let's, oh yeah. Just a quick question, John. Uh, how many nodes do these kinds of results start to pay off? Like, do we need a thousand nodes? Can we do this with a few dozen nodes? Most of, it, it, it just kind of depends on uh, on, on your data set. Uh, what I saw at Yahoo was there were some data sets which could actually justify using a thousand nodes, like some of the big uh, quick prediction data sets. Um, more typically, You'd be like 50 nodes or 100 nodes. Uh, if you took a look at your communication uh, time versus your, and your computation time, so your computation time is dropping as you have more nodes. Your communication time is increasing. Hope it doesn't increase too quickly. And then you know, there's some sort of minimum, which is the point that you use. So that point was often 50 nodes or so. Right? 
even if you're running on three computers, you're still going to see some improvement. <coughs> Obviously, it'll be limited by factor of three, but uh, the factor of three can be good if you have a long computation. Yeah. Um, maybe me question. If, if, if in practice you end up having to do these uh, cross validation things over grids, does does that ever just make it easier to just coarse grain parallelize it and add on your cross validation in parallel, or is it a way to like, take advantage of some kind of extra? Yeah. So when when people are doing machine learning practice, they're often doing parameter search or hyperparameter search, basically, uh, on one sort or another. And uh, you know, a crude and simple way to use these big clusters is you just you have a bunch of individual nodes, and each of them sucks in all the data with the thing with its own parameter setting, and you just compare the, the results with different parameter settings. Uh, so that is, uh, I think, if your data set is not too large, that's a very reasonable thing to do, uh, and, and that works fine as far as your overall workflow. Uh, these data sets were large enough that. So if you suck 20 terabytes into a single machine, it's not going to be happy. How about copying the data in the first place to all these machines? Isn't that the same load? Uh, so I think the idea is that you copy the data once into the system, and then you don't ever copy it again. And so you, you, you pay the cost of moving the data once, and not, not uh, every single time you do an experiment. Okay, so this is uh, kind of, okay, so when you're trying to, to look at how people get data, it's often rather different from uh, paying people to label data. So maybe you're displaying news stories and you want to decide which news story is going to be of interest to people. Right? So uh, maybe a user comes to company, they have some history of previous visits, maybe an IP address, maybe they have some data related to their account, uh, you choose some information to present, and then the user reacts to this. So the thing which is important here is that if you display news stories about the Packers Saints, uh, uh, you're not going to know anything about whether or not people are interested in in Gazi or in uh, the Harper government. <laughs> you, you, don't, you, don't have, you don't have any information to make that judgment. Right, so this, this, is, this is rather different from, from supervised learning. In supervised learning, uh, you have somebody who labels things and says, ah, this is, this is what the right answer is, or, or maybe it's even cost sensitive and, and they're saying, Oh, this is a good answer, and that's a bad answer, and this is an okay answer, and so forth. Right. So here, you don't really have fully supervised information. All that you have is partial feedback. All that you know is, did they click on the particular story that you happen to choose? Right. So it gives you some interest of how, it gives you a notion of how interested they are in what you chose, but not how interested they are in what you did not choose to display. So that's, that's, a, that's a very different kind of setting. Uh, here's another example of this. So this is clinical decision making. So I guess presenting news stories or ads or whatever is kind of frivolous in some sense, but this really matters. So a patient comes to a doctor. They have symptoms and some medical history test results. The doctor chooses a treatment. The patient responds to it. So this is the same kind of structure where uh, you only get information about the actions you actually chose. So typically you don't know what would have happened if they had given you a different treatment. <coughs> and now you want a policy for choosing the best treatment. So this is a, uh, so I stopped taking the medicine because I prefer the original disease to the side effects. That one yeah. has potential and ethical side to it as well in that what would allow you to learn the fastest may not be good for people who are taking the medicine too, which is interesting, interesting twist. Yeah, so there is there is just kind of an ethical problem there. Uh, but the standard 
for medical trials is in fact randomized trials. Now the way, the particular way that they do the randomized trials turns out to not be optimal as far as you know minimizing the number of deaths. So I guess I, I think there's a lot of political issues and basically non-technical issues associated with exactly how trials are run. But um, or do they allow more deaths in a trial to reduce the number of deaths later on after it you know, comes to market and things like that? Okay, so with, with the with the with the should. mathematics suggests you should do is you, you should not regard, you shouldn't think of things as just having a trial. You should, you should have some initial exploration, and then if you have encouraging results, you keep on exploring over more and more and more until uh, you know the new treatment just kind of takes over everything. So you don't have discrete trials. You have constant monitoring, and uh, the amount of exploration that you're doing should be dependent upon the quality of the outcomes that you're observing. If you do that well, you should be able to do it substantially better than the current medical, uh, medical trial system. Okay, so this is the conditional bandwidth setting. Uh, this is this is a to formalize these kinds of operations. So you you have a, uh, an online setting where you're running through individual examples. Uh, you uh, see some context, you see some features. Choose an action, and then you get a reward for that individual action. And now you want to learn a good policy, choosing actions given context. So a policy is something which maps features to actions. You have a set of policies. So in learning theory, uh, the way that you describe uh, I learn is you say I have a set of policies, and I compete with the set. So that, that can what that, that will mean for us is regret. So we're taking a look at the best policy in the set that has some particular average reward, and then you have the reward that you actually measure. You want your regret to be small. So you want to compete with a large set of policies uh, while having a small regret. Okay, so this, in learning theory, there's actually two different ways we talk about learning, and they end up being very similar to each other uh, in terms of the kinds of bounds you can prove. One of them is a regret type bound. The other one, uh, you have some sort of assumed distribution over events, and you talk about your average uh, reward compared to the best, uh, best policy to average reward. Okay, so what are examples of the policy? So it could be just what is the best single action? What is the best single action? So this is what clinical trials typically get at. Uh, should you treat with drug A or drug B, or, or, or drug A or no drug, or drug A or drug B? Uh, just what is the best single action? You could have your set of policies be the set of all linear predictors. Would be a common choice. It could be all decision trees. Um, you could have it be. Uh, some discrete set based upon the main specific conscience. So if you only talk to a doctor, and you can say, uh, what do you how, when do you think we should treat? And then you can talk to another doctor and say, when do you think we should treat? When do you think we should treat? You can write down each of these policies as a, as a rule, and then uh, you try to use contextual bandit learning in order to optimize for the best. Okay, so, in machine learning, so there's kind of a, a tension between machine learning and statistics. And, and one of the core <coughs> reasons why there's a tension is because uh, statisticians often like to do math and say, uh, you know, this is the right approach to doing things. And machine learning people, I think in the beginning in particular, were very much into like just doing things. So like, uh, so statistician would say, oh, no, you need to write down your assumptions. And, uh, and uh, you know, understand what the right thing to do is given the assumptions. And the machine learning person will be just like, no, I just, just ran the algorithm and it worked. Uh, see, um, the you can't do that here. You actually have to understand the statistics of what's going on. You, you can't just follow your nose in the contextual band setting. Uh, you have to explore to succeed. You have to understand how to incorporate the exploration information properly in order to, to succeed. That, that's 
strict. Uh, so thinking back, you, you just can't determine whether or not you should be presenting a news article about um, Quebec uh, versus a news article about some sports team if you only display sports teams. There's no, the information is not there. Okay. One uh, other book people use to describe these is in terms of a bandit problem. So a bandit problem is the same as a contextual bandit, except there's no X. That means the only set of policies that you can really compete with is the context of your policies. Okay, so you can, of course, decide to ignore all of your assigned information. You can ignore uh, the observations about, you, you can ignore this, uh, the symptoms, and just go with treatment. That actually, by the way, that reminds me of when I was at Caltech, the joke was that if you went to the healthcare center, uh, they, they had two prescriptions. One of them was drink water, and the other one was a student pregnancy. <laughs> um, so you, you can, of course, choose to ignore all your symptoms when you come to treatment, and that's very limited, right? In, in practice, when you're at a company and you have somebody who's actually applying machine learning even badly, often they will uh, get, provide superior performance to somebody who ignores the uh, features and does some, does just plain bandit learning. Okay, so generalization across X requires C for these problems. Okay, so now um, the first things you want to do in these settings is you want to know when you've succeeded. It's non trivial to know that you've succeeded because uh, you have actions. I mean, if you come up with a new policy, you have some data from the past, you come up with a new policy, new policy chooses different actions. So if your new policy chooses actions which are entirely different from your recorded data, you have no information. And so you, you can't even evaluate your new policy well. So the question is how do we how do we create a system for evaluating policies? Introduce noise. Random exploration is indeed the answer. So the, uh, uh, the naive approach, of course, is you just <coughs> um, So if you randomly explore with <coughs> actions, you're going to have features, action, and reward, and implicitly or, or uniform random over the different actions. Uh, <coughs> so now, um, kind of a tricky thing here. So when you're exploring randomly, if you have a probability of the action, then you actually do want to record that and use it. But if you don't have a probability, there's often a trick, which is you can estimate the probabilities directly. This is essentially multi-class probability prediction. Right? You can estimate the probability of the action directly. You can also build an estimator of the reward directly. So one of the uh, simpler approaches people try to use is they just build an estimator given the features in the action what is the reward. Uh, and that, that, that kind of works, but you better have exploration data or else it's not going to work. Uh, and it turns out you can do something even better. So you can combine the P hat and the R hat to create an estimator of the value of a policy. So the policy number is something that matches features to actions. You take the average over your data of reward minus your reward estimate. This is an indicated function of the policy using the action uh, divided by the estimated probability of the action given the features uh, plus the estimated reward. So this is the double robust estimate for the value of so policy. So one is not p hat, just the indicated function of pi of x equals a. So the, the idea is that we're, we're doing random exploration. So this is 
This is, this, is the, this is the probability or the exploration policy, not the policy we're trying to evaluate. So we're randomly exploring and choosing the actions. Pi is not the same as the exploration policy. Right, and that, that's key. So we want to be able to record data just like in supervised learning and then evaluate policies offline later. But these are deterministic policies. This pi could be deterministic. You, you can also, if it happens to be randomized and you make this be the probability that pi is actually Oh, and you need to adjust things here too. You take the expectation with respect to the policy of the reward. <coughs> so this is the double robust estimate. Um, okay, so if R hat is the expectation, then they claim this gives you the right answer because the expectation of R minus R hat will be zero. Okay. So this term will go away R hat is uh, the correct answer. So if you have a very good reward estimate, you win. Uh, if you have a terrible reward estimate and you have a good probability estimate, that turns out you also win. So this is a little bit tricky, but uh, let's suppose that R hat is equal to zero. Right? So then this term goes away, this term goes away, this is the Reward times indicated function of probability that features the action uh, divided by the prob probability, and that also is an unbiased estimate. In any combination, so, so you have kind of two ways to estimate that are combined here. So if you err, so if your reward estimate differs from your expectation, and your probability estimate differs from the truth. You can prove a theorem that says that the error in your estimate is bounded by big delta times little delta. So when I was growing up, uh, my mother would say, two wrongs don't make a right. Um, but, but here you have two wrongs which because they're less than one, at least make a less wrong. Right? So this is uh, this is a very helpful technique. This is this is how you this is the best way I know to evaluate policies offline. Uh, and empirically it works quite well, but I also wanted to discuss the exploration uh, for just a few minutes. Uh, so to go back to this problem, you need to be, if you're actually in the online loop, you need to be choosing the probability of the actions in order to optimize things well. And th there's, there's several techniques which are, you know, basic approaches, but there's a, a new approach that we worked out. Uh, so this is policy elimination. And this is, this has, this new approach has two properties. One of them is, you can understand it, um, which is, a big improvement over what was previously there. And also, um, it gives you the optimal rate. So if you have a set of policies, uh, we're gonna have some minimum probability of exploration, and then we're gonna have our empirical reward estimate. So this is your double robust estimate. So when you have random actions, you can, you can get an estimate of the value of the policy. So at each time step, you choose a distribution over your remaining policies, such that for every remaining policy, the expected variance of your value estimate is small. So let's go back here. When p hat goes to zero, you have a problem. Your, your variance is going to blow up, and that does sound good. So the tricky thing in choosing your exploration distribution well is you need to make sure that your probabilities don't get too small. So you choose the distribution over your policies carefully. You observe your features, you draw, uh, okay, so you project the distribution on policies into the distribution on actions. So, so if you draw a random policy and you evaluate it against the features, you get an action. So a distribution on policies induces a distribution on actions. And then you, you draw your action, you observe your reward, and then, uh, can use balance to 
to, uh, to reduce the set of policies <coughs> over time. So that's only reducing very slowly that set of policies. Uh, so it depends on what you mean by very slowly. So uh, what you can prove is that for all sets of policies, for all distributions, Imagine the world is IID expected to some distribution generating the data. Now, with high probability, they start to regret the scourge of K log number of policies. So if we're doing supervised learning, there would be no dependence on K. K is the number of actions. If you do epsilon greedy type things and you op optimize your epsilon well, you end up getting a uh, two-thirds power. So if you have a million events, the amount of exploration required for this approach is a factor of 10 less than for epsilon greedy. And that's, that's, uh, that's much better. So these kinds of, there's essentially two families of algorithms that are now known solve conditional band problems. This is, this is the new family. Uh, there's an older one called EXP4. Uh, anybody familiar with EXP4? Joel, Joel knows it, but okay. Um, <coughs> that one is kind of more complex. Um, That's a, for finite dimensional set of policies. I mean, for finite size set of policies. Yeah. If it's parametric. You can get a VC dimension like result if you want. <clears throat> okay, so the, the, all of the policies, all of the approaches which can give you the square root dependence have this property that they kind of mix together exploration and exploitation character uh, throughout, throughout the, the entire learning process. So one problem with this algorithm is that uh, it's computationally slow because we're enumerating policies and checking things. And that of course doesn't really work. Yes? Just the question of the like the setting here with the yeah. different actions and how would you compare that to like an uh, econometric approach with the like your random utility discrete choice framework? Could you relate it to that literature? What is like I, I think it, I Kind of metric approach isn't, uh, I don't understand what that means well enough to answer. Uh, what I can tell you is that um, we use these kinds of algorithms for things like setting the reserve price in the auctions, yeah. and, and keyword auctions. And, and this was the approach which worked well. Okay, so uh, a disadvantage of this is it's slow. It turns out there's a way to fix that, at least in theory. So if you have a, a optimization order, so remember that is you see a supervised learning algorithm that can run the same policy set, it turns out that you can employ the ellipsoid algorithm uh, to get something which is poly TK log number policies computation. So this, this is kind of amazing because this is, this is one of the rare times in my life when uh, I took something that was order and made a logarithm. So it's, a, it's an exponential reduction in the amount of required. Now, who, who knows ellipsoid? All right, so anybody who knows ellipsoid knows that it doesn't actually work. Because ellipsoid is, it's, it's one of these theoretical hammers that lets you say, ah, oh, it's one at a time. But the quality is about 12 in this particular case. <coughs> okay, so. I think I'm, I'm about done, uh, over in fact. Um, making the textual bandit learning really efficient, not just kind of theoretically efficient, I think is one of the main challenges which remains. Um, uh, that's this question. And then there's also the more complex algorithms, the nonlinear algorithms in a parallel setting. I think this is a substantial challenge. Um, 
So those are two of the things that I'm working on right now. Okay, other questions? things that I think is limiting GPUs is, uh, is you have a single GPU. And, and the single GPU tends to be pretty limited in terms of just the amount of memory it has. And in terms of the bandwidth, the, I mean, it's just, you just have a single GPU. And maybe you can get a computer which can have up to eight GPUs. But you only have eight GPUs. Uh, one of the things that I want Once you can ship things over the network interface, uh, suddenly it becomes possible to scale much more than you could otherwise do. That it seems a, a trick which um, I learned at Microsoft is that networking is actually phenomenal these days because people figured out how to create large clusters which have full bisection bandwidth. And that means that you can connect every pair of nodes and they talk to each other in both directions at full speed without ever clogging the network. So, so, so for example, if you have a choice between buying a, net, a cluster with gigabit Ethernet or some kind of expensive in band type communication, do you actually see these advantages of paying the extra money to get? Or is, is, he, is, is gigabit Ethernet enough? So, gigabit Ethernet, I think, is not enough these days. But the minimum that I would consider is 10 gigabit Ethernet. Um, and I would want to make that either full bisection bandwidth or pretty near to that. So the, whether or not you have full bisection bandwidth has to do with exactly how you create your switch topology, which wires up different racks in your cluster. Um, we're actually looking at 40 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, so you don't believe in any band type press? So InfiniBand is, is nice. The thing which I found a little bit frustrating about InfiniBand is that InfiniBand to Ethernet doesn't work very mm -hmm. well. And uh, so InfiniBand gives you 56 gigabits per second, but 40 gigabit Ethernet gives you 40 gigabits per second. But it's, it's fairly close. Mm -hmm. And because you don't have to uh, change protocols, it ends up being superior because you're talking to Ethernet everywhere else. I think but InfiniBand gives you remote direct memory access and much lower latency. If that's what's important, then that's So you can do re remote direct memory access with, through Ethernet. That's a efficiency property of the card. And their cards actually support both InfiniBand and a 40 gigabit Ethernet. Um, <coughs> the latency is to some extent there, but um, I think once you get things down to a certain microsecond scales, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that much. I think both from a programming point of view than a theoretical performance point of view. I haven't actually programmed in Finiband, so I don't have a good sense of exactly how you use it from a programming point of view. So another follow-up yeah. question with respect to uh, configuration. So, uh, how, how much memory do you have per node, or, or maybe more precisely, how much memory can each of your processes use on your nodes that, to make it? And, and is there something important about that where it no longer becomes even feasible unless you have X available for the kinds of algorithms you're talking about? Yeah, so for the kinds of algorithms I'm talking about, you have the entire model and the various optimization stuff on a node. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be the case that the model fits on an individual node. Mm -hmm. Now for the machines that we had access to at Yahoo, that meant that we were running around with like four gigabytes or so. Huh. So that, that limited the model size to some extent because with LBFTS in particular, you need about a factor of 10 more memory uh, than, than just destroying the raw model itself. Um, but, but there's, there's a change coming, which is that servers can support a lot of RAM. So uh, the machines that we're getting right now are 192 gigabytes. It's, uh, it's quite a lot. Yeah, this, but it seems like this may have some dramatic, maybe direct or subtle implications on the algorithm design with respect to how much you're holding in memory uh, in these experiments or is what you might do in the future. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like when you, how often do you do your algorithm? You don't, you don't even touch disk? Uh, I guess, I mean, so I didn't really describe this, but um, VW creates cache files. So we didn't want to store the, the data in RAM because I needed to reserve the RAM for the model. Right. So I read the data in this text. I created a binary format and dropped it to disk. And then I would read back over the binary format when I needed to record the data. Okay. And that binary format's the order of what? How much memory? Uh, I mean, it's just kind of, it's just a compressed binary format. It's similar to the text, so maybe a vector 10 better. Okay. Okay. So if you have 192 memory, that would, that would help a lot. I mean, yeah. caching the data in, in RAM becomes much more feasible when you have 192 gigabytes of RAM. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, so, so uh, this is interesting because like uh, this whole uh, issue of uh, RAM speed and uh, band bandwidth plus bandwidth is really critical for anything to do with GPUs. And yeah. and once you start talking about 192 gig on a note, something similar starts to come up. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah? I guess I was wondering if you can expand a little bit more, switch of topics, but on the Oracle assumption over your yeah. policy. Is so that why you're, you're getting a lot of that power in terms of the log of the policy space? Yes. So, w in fact, you can't do it without an Oracle assumption. So if you have an arbitrary policy space, yeah. there's no way to search it yeah. efficiently other than linear time, right. right? So in practice, we have learning algorithms. These learning algorithms can, can search through policy spaces so, uh, very efficiently. Uh, so we're, we're, met, we're thinking of the learning algorithm as an oracle searching through the policy space. So we're, we're imagining that we can give a data set to an oracle, and in unit time, it can return to us uh, the policy which optimizes which minimizes the error rate in that data set. I see. Right. I see. So we're running, essentially what happens is when we're playing around with this lipsoid algorithm, yeah. we're running a learning algorithm over and over again yeah. uh, in order to uh, extract a good policy. And is there a way to relax that somehow, like have a some kind of a noisy oracle that doesn't quite optimize it and still get some tight computation results? I haven't thought about that carefully. Just so an expert, you know, kind of one of these noisy expert. Yeah, so you think about sort of an approximate oracle. Um, for this particular algorithm, I would say probably not. Okay. Because at least when you relaxed it, it would, the errors would play badly. Uh, it may be that one does exist where you can tolerate errors. All right, thank you.